to a place that feels worlds away for many people and shows us that it is not so far off at all. It's just another facet of human experience. Please join me in welcoming our 2013 Medallion Lecture Speaker, Maria Hornbacher. Thanks everybody for being here tonight. It's really a delight to be here. Thanks everybody who organized these events today and for all the people who attended this afternoon. What a gift to me that was to spend time with you today. Thanks especially to Diane for all of your hard work in putting this, this day, this trip together. And thank you, Crest. You know, this is just, it's a remarkable community that you have. And when I hear that mental health is the most pressing issue here, it doesn't surprise me. Um, but it's unbelievable to see people sitting up and going, oh wow, if that's a pressing issue, we need to attend to it. Because when people say mental health, most of the time, you go, well, that's a mental starter. And uh, if there's nothing really you can approach. There's no way to approach it. And you are approaching it. You are addressing it. And I'm, I'm impressed. I'm impressed and I'm delighted to be a part of it. So thank you for being here tonight. As I was beginning to prepare for this conversation, I went through an old talk when I gave maybe five years ago on mental illness. <coughs> As I was reading, I was reading, I started to count the number of times I had used the words illness and ill, 174 times in under an hour. That's not just an unhelpful outlook, it's bad writing. <laughs> Tonight, I'll do better. To my dismay, I was not able to prepare a whole talk on this topic without naming it. Still, let's frame this a little differently. Let's not worry so much about illness, and let's think about mental health. At some point in the past few years, I got tired of thinking myself as ill, thinking of myself as ill. It's exhausting. It's not ultimately at the core of who I am. It's an element of my experience. It is a fact of my biology. It is a facet of myself. So is the fact that I'm a teacher and a student, a wife and a friend, a daughter and an aunt, someone who does laundry and empties the dishwasher and takes walks by the river and has coffee and embarrassingly <coughs> still smokes. And incidentally, I have an illness. I have occasional brain failure, a squiggly lump of gray matter tucked neatly into my skull, sometimes shorts out. But a lot of the time it works okay. So it makes no sense to identify myself primarily or always with an illness. I'm not ill right now. When I'm ill, I'll deal with being ill. The rest of the time I'm in some stage of healing. I'm on the complex, lovely, difficult, lifelong journey of recovery. This is what real recovery looks like. It looks like you and me. It looks like this, this us. It's time for us to shift gears and move from stagnation to action. It's time to let go of the belief that we are inherently broken, to knowing we're absolutely whole and capable of healing yet more. We believed, people with mental illness, for too long that we will never be more than we are now, never have more than we have right now, today, never have sanity, never have peace. Who says? I say, they're wrong, I know they're wrong. It can be better for all of us, as individuals and as a community of people working toward a common goal. That goal is the transformation of lives of people like me and people like you who need help and don't always get enough. The work ahead of us will require a radical change of direction. We cannot stay the course we're on. It leads to limitation. It leads to the loss of people that we need. And ultimately, it leads to the incremental destruction of not just our minds, but our hopes, our spirits, and our lives. We can do better than that. This needs to turn around, and we need to be the ones who do the way. And we don't need to do it alone. We can't. We need to collaborate, communicate with one another, take action, and advocate for each other and ourselves. Here is a joke. So there's a guy sitting in a ditch. This joke is usually about an alcoholic, but it works just as well with anyone in need of help. So pick your poison. Anyway, this alcoholic is in this ditch, a narrow little ditch, and steep walls and little light is down there in pretty much despair because how is he going to get out of this ditch? There's no way out. He's just about ready to give up hope. When up above, he sees a doctor, so he yells, hey, help, can you help? And the doctor yells, here, take these, and throws down a bottle of pills. And the guy thinks, okay, but I needed a ladder. He sits down on the ground again and goes back to despair. In a little while, he hears footsteps above, and he shouts up again, help. And a priest comes to the edge of the ditch and peers down. I never tell jokes. I love this joke. The man says, can you help me? And the priest says, of course, I'll pray for you. And he leaves, presumably to pray. The guy thinks, well, OK, but that doesn't really address the immediate concern of the ditch. He slumps onto the ground. And after a few hours, 
It's cold, it's dark, he's hungry, he's scared, and he hears footsteps once again. Without a lot of hope, he sort of feebly yells, help. And then another alcoholic comes to the edge of the ditch, sees him down there, and jumps in. The guy in the ditch says, what you going to do that for? Now we're both stuck here. And the guy who jumped in says calmly, I've been here before. I know where you are. <laughs> there is a way out. We need to show one another that way. My journey isn't special. We walk this path side by side. We know the twists and turns of this road. We know the cliffs and the valleys, the flight and the fall. We know where mental illness takes some of us, the seeming heavens and the hells. We know the way the road shape shifts. It seems at first that we're walking on solid ground. Then suddenly it gets rocky and we stumble just a little. But soon we find a foothold and we start climbing and we're sure we're on our way up. And then without warning, our feet slip again and we fall. And we have no idea where or if we'll land. Maybe it goes on this way for years. It did for me. The exhausting track over ground that never seems to stay beneath your feet. The frustration, the moments of exhilaration, the fear, and finally, at least for me, the despair. The sense that it could never be any other way. The crushing belief that another path was inaccessible to me. The belief that things will never change. But they can. For me, and for many of you, things have changed. Things do change. Maybe the road we walk isn't always easy. Maybe the road is not the same everybody else walks. Maybe it's rockier. Maybe more winding. Maybe some days we still have to work with all our might to put one foot in front of the other as we go. But it's not the impossible, the impassable path we once knew. The ground is solid beneath us. We can take this journey through our lives. And the lives of people like me, and the lives of people like you, can be rich and full of promise. Our lives are more than illness. We are infinitely more than the disorders we may have. But if we were to find that solid ground and stay on it, there are two things we need to do. We have to accept, and we have to have hope. The journey I'm on isn't, is one that has led from a place of battle to a place of peace. And the journey isn't done. It won't be. That is the great gift of staying alive. The healing process allows us to get plenty of support and take incredibly good care of ourselves and begin to heal. There is always hope, and we can never give up. My journey began with acceptance, radical acceptance maybe, and acceptance of the fact that I walked this road with an illness I wouldn't have chosen for myself. Acceptance of the fact that my life, my mind, my very self are influenced and to some extent shaped by that illness. Acceptance of the fact that this companion on my journey may never entirely go away. Absolute acceptance of the need to manage my own health, take care of my body, spirit, and mind every day, without fail. Acceptance of the fact that this isn't easy, but acceptance also that this is the hand I was dealt, and I intend to play it well. Before acceptance, there was the fight. There was my screaming resistance to the illness I did have, my refusal to acknowledge its power, my unwillingness to face the fact of it, my inability to see that as long as I kept fighting, I would be unable to live in peace. I would be unable to live in any kind of joy. I would be unable to really live. The fight lasted for years, ripped me apart, tore my family and pieces, friends to pieces, and left me at death's door. And that was when I knew there had to be another way. The way I have chosen, the way many of you have as well, is the way to solid ground. The only path there, so far as I know, is to accept. We have our illnesses, we have diseases sometimes of the brain for which at this time there is no cure. An easy fact? No. Living with mental illness can be harder than hell. Acceptance itself doesn't come overnight, but it can be worked for, and it can be won, and the payoff is peace of mind. But before we reach acceptance and peace, as so many of you know, there is the confusion and the fight and the fear. And this is the story of mine. Oh, reading. From chapter one. Mom, I whisper loudly, pushing on her shoulder. It's dark, I'm in my parents' bedroom, a ghost in my white nightie. Mom, I say again, shaking her. I bounce up and down on her toes and lean over her, my mouth near her ear. Mom, I have to tell you something. What is it? She mumbles, opening one eye. The goat man, I whisper, agitated. He's in my room. He came while I was sleeping. You have to make him leave. I can't sleep. Will you read to me? I hop about, crashing into the nightstand. Can we make a cake? 
I want to make a cake. I can't go to school. I'm scared of Teacher Jackie. She yells at us. She doesn't like me. Mom, the goat man, do you have to go to work tomorrow? Will you read to me? All right. It's the middle of the night, she says, hoisting herself up on her elbow. Next to her, the mountain of my father snores. Can we read tomorrow, she says. I can't go back in my room, I shriek, running around in a tiny circle. The goat man will get me. We can make cookies instead. I want to buy a horse, a great one. And I want to go to the beach and collect seashells. Can we go to the beach? I promise I'll sleep tomorrow. My mother swings her legs off the edge of the bed and holds me by the shoulders. Honey, can you slow down, she says. Just slow down. Out of breath, I stand there, my head spinning. What did you want to tell me, she asks. One thing. Tell me the most important thing you had to tell me. The goat man, I say, and I burst into tears, but mom, I can't. Shh, she says, picking me up. She carries me down the hall. This is how she fixes it. She holds me very tight and things slow down a little, but I'm too upset. I set my chin on her shoulder and sob and babble. Everyone's going to leave. You'll forget to come get me. I'll get lost. I'll get stuck in the grocery store and they'll lock me in. What if there are snakes in my bedroom? Why won't the goat man go away? What if it isn't perfect? What if it's scary? What if you and dad die? Who will take care of me? What if you give me away? I don't want you to give me away. I want to be a policeman. Why do policemen wear hats? Maria, hush. It's all right. Everything is going to be all right. We pace up and down the hall. I get more and more agitated, swinging moment by moment from terror to elation to despair, until finally I wiggle my way free and start to run. I race around the house, my mother trailing me, until I stumble on my nightgown and sprawl out on the floor, sobbing, beating my fists on the ground. I'm here, she says. Honey, I'm here. I snuffle and drag a hiccup in breath and heave a sigh. She is here. She is right here. She picks me up. She carries me into the bathroom and turns on the bathtub. While it runs, I squirm on her lap, kicking my legs, shrieking, laughing, crying. I can't ever go back to my room. The goat man, I want to have a party. When is it Christmas? I want to live in a treehouse. What if I fall in the ocean? Where do I go when I die? She pulls my nightgown over my head and sets me in the tub. I am suddenly very quiet. Water makes it better. In the water, I'm safe. She kneels next to me, only my head sticking out of the water, and she tells me a story. Things are slowing down. I am contained. I bobble the water, warm and closed. My limbs float. The noise and racing of my thoughts wind down until they yawn in my head as if they're in slow motion. My head is filled with white cotton, and I hear a low humming, and my skull is heavy, and I'm aware only of the water in my mother's